This episode is about going back to basics. Hi, welcome to Snapshot, the show that's all about taking better photos, taking better video. I'm your host, Dennis Rule, and this episode is a little bit different from the others. Recently, I was invited to speak at a Lunch and Learn event here in Ottawa. I took the camera along, recorded the presentation. There's a lot of information here, so what I've done is I've time mapped everything so that you can come back to it and refer to it, bookmark the episode, and watch it over and over again, and I guarantee you your photography is going to improve just through composition. I call it better photos through composition. Check it out. Today's presentation is really camera agnostic. It doesn't deal with any specific camera. It could be dealing with a, a big expensive one like Dr. Bell has that I can't afford, or you know, your iPhone. It's really it's about working the muscle behind the eyes, not the piece of equipment you put in front of it. So, um, I wanted to take a second too to thank uh, the committee that helped put all of this together: Marion Cowenberg, Teresa Bova, Irene Hamrick, and the person whose idea this actually was, who isn't here today, unfortunately, Marie, Marie Primo, who's uh, away on sick leave. Uh, but uh, thanks to you guys for all the help in putting this all together. So, Dennis is an accomplished uh, professional photographer with over 35 years of experience and his skills uh, extend to capturing the true essence of people and their environment. I can't deliver these lines. I don't know where you wrote, sorry. Um, <laughs> you came up with it. <laughs> Whether it's commercial, advertising, fashion, uh, dance, headshots, actor portraits, then it's the uh, secret is really to focus on the people and what they're trying to achieve. So um, it's probably why he's been so good and so popular at what he does. Um, in his continuing efforts to expand his uh, broad selection of cutting-edge photographic services. He travels around the world, he speaks at many uh, international conferences and attends many of them as well. So he not only learns but shares what he's learned. So um, and the practice improvement photography team, that's uh, Marie and Marion and Irene and myself, um, had the pleasure of working with, uh, studying with Dennis uh, for some, uh, on an intensive course and we were, really learned a lot from Dennis, it was very useful. And we're thrilled that he accepted our invitation to present today. So without any further ado, Dennis Rule. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. That's, that's very kind. Uh, thank you guys for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule to come and hear my ramblings on, on photography. Um, it's, it's a passion for me. It's not just my job. It's, it's my hobby. It's been my whole life. I started being a photographer um, really at, at at a very young age when I had a film camera that my father gave to me and he used to get very mad that I used to spend a lot of money, a lot of his money on film. Uh, mostly on developing, so you guys, uh, some, some of you, and, and depending on how long you've been in the hobby, will remember that when you used to push the button, it used to cost you money. We have the, the, uh, the advantage of digital now, and uh, you know, I, I run a little TV show, or a little web show called Snapshot. And my tagline at the end is, go out there, shoot lots, because pixels are free. Uh, you'll remember that you know, with, with film, uh, those of you who shot with it, you used to have to go out, fix your shots, get your film to the lab. Depending on whether you're using a, a high-speed lab or a, a, a slow process, it depended on your budget, uh, you either had your photos back in an hour or you had them back in a week. And even if it was an hour later, you didn't remember what you did when you took the shot anyway. They used to, you know, I, one of my secrets was to write notes. I still do that today. When I set up a shot, I write notes. That way I can go back and recreate the shot at any given time. I know what my settings were. Now, the settings on the next photo may not be exactly the same. The lighting conditions could be a little bit different. There could be a whole lot of different things. But today what I want to talk to you guys about the most is composition. Because good photography can be done with any camera at all. Like Jean said, the iPhone or the, the top-end Pro DSLR of no matter what brand. 90, or I'd say about 80% of the photos that are in this presentation have been taken just recent, well, over the last few months, but many of them just recently on a holiday because I knew I was going to be speaking here, and they were taken with this camera. Uh, this is a 
it's an advanced kind of point and shoot system that has interchangeable lenses and it gives you a lot of control. They're the mirrorless cameras and I'm, I've really fallen in love with it because in my camera bag, I have five lenses, a flash, and a microphone, and I'm ready for anything at all. My holiday was a motorcycle holiday, so I didn't even have room for that. All I had room for was this camera, a, bat a spare battery, a charger, and I brought one other lens. So without any more ramblings, let's talk about composition. What is composition? Composition is really simple. I mean, I could get into all kinds of fancy words, but being able to place an object in a scene by using some thought, thinking about what we're going to do, and applying some, some simple rules, uh, and making use of various elements. That's composition. Okay? And you can do that with any camera, any, any recording media at all. So good composition will generate interest. It should tell a story. Right? I always, when I look at a photo, what's that photo telling me? It should lead the viewer's eye through the photo. I mean, you should be able to look at a whole bunch of different things and say, wow, that's kind of cool and there's some, there's, some, uh, there's some interest in the photo or impact, if you will. And we achieve that using certain rules. So as a photographer, you have control on what you shoot, the time of day that you shoot it at. Now, it's not always convenient. If you're in the holidays and you're on a bus tour, it may be a little hard to pick the time of day, but you know you have to do the best that you can. You often, and uh, if you're going out on a photo walk or a photo excursion, you do have uh, control over the distance to your subject. If I'm doing a portrait of this gentleman here, I can choose to shoot it here, or I can shoot to shoot it here. It's my choice as a photographer. In certain cases, if you're using a DSLR or a mirrorless system that permits it, you can choose the lens that you're going to use. If you're using your iPhone, I'm going to show you a perfect zoom, and it's this, your feet. You can zoom in, and it's the cheapest zoom you can ever buy, but use it, okay? Uh, the other thing that you can do with your body is you can choose the position that you're going to shoot. If you have the luxury of a camera that allows you to change the settings, then you can do so. It's not the end all. If you know how your camera thinks, you can trick it. And those of you who were in my course fi figured that out. We figured out how the camera thinks. The camera thinks everything is 18% gray. So if we think that it's brighter than 18% gray, we can compensate for that. Just by you know, ha holding your hand over the shade to stop a lens flare. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do to trick your camera. And then finally, you have control over your composition because it's, you're, the, you're the photographer, you're the artist, it's your choice. So if you've driven by Watson's Mill um, down in Manatick, this is a shot taken at what I call blue hour. And blue hour is when the sun has just gone set and it's not dark out yet. Um, you can do some wonderful things. Every, one of the main questions I get asked, where were you when you took this shot? I was under the bridge. <laughs> Okay, and I set up and I waited and waited and waited. I watched the sun go down and I started clicking my camera. And I took quite a few shots because okay, the first one is not necessarily going to be correct. The route to good composition involves analysis, some effort. Is this an interesting angle? Um, would the photo improve if I climbed the stairs? Would it be better if I went down low? Should I get closer, further away? And is this the right time of day? We're lucky we live, I think most of you live in Ottawa, and I mean, you have the luxury of being able to go to Parliament Hill at noon on your day off, or at seven o'clock in the evening, or maybe five o'clock in the evening in the wintertime when the Christmas lights are on, right? That's your choice. You have that luxury. So as a photographer. Now, as a tourist, you don't always have that luxury. I get that. The most important rule in composition, and this is the number one, I couldn't I didn't put all the composition rules in. I've, I've put in the top ones that I figured were necessary. Because this really, when I teach this course, it's normally a four-hour course. And I know a lot of you would like to be here for four hours, but you can't. I get that. So um, the rule of thirds is the most important thing. Has anyone heard of the rule of thirds in, in the past? OK, cool. So the definition is quite simple. Imagine you take a photo, any photo, and actually, you can think of it as any piece of art, any canvas. 
If I break that down into nine quadrants by putting in two horizontal lines and two vertical lines, I can break that down into nine quadrants, okay? It's, it's effective and it's so simple, really, when we think about it. And many cameras have a, a function called grid, and it actually puts the lines there for you, so you can start using it. Um, it's been used for hundreds of years. Like I said, it's in paintings from Rembrandt days to graphic arts like the poster that, uh, that you guys made up for this. It's actually a wonderful poster for this event. And if we break it up, we talk about lines, and we also talk about intersection points. So every time we have the lines intersection, we call that a point of interest. So there are four. We break up our, our horizon. Okay, so we, have, we break up the image in thirds. We also break up our verticals. And you'll notice that you know, in, in these lines, we've, we've got trees. There are already our vertical lines. And where do you place your subject in relation to those lines? So a typical centered composition. Now this is taken with a digital camera. Uh, we're using uh, studio strobes for those who are interested. And we've created some smoke. And this is actually in a dance classroom, but we wanted to make it look like she was on stage. One of my favorite tools to use, and Halloween is coming up, well, in a few months, but it's a lot sooner than we think. But in the stores, you will find smoke machines for Halloween for about seven, 40 to $79. And they're a great tool if you're into photography. Moving a, the, dan in this case, a dancer again, uh, into a alternate point, moving her across one of the lines of interest, gives us a sense of motion. It gives the photograph a whole different feel than having her right in the middle. There's a sense of action. There's a sense of movement. We look at it in uh, a landscape mode. In this photo here, we've got an equal division. We've got sky, mid-ground, and foreground, and they're all kind of equal parts. But just by tilting the camera, using the grid, I can emphasize the sky. I can emphasize the foreground. And it's simply a matter of tilting the camera. I haven't changed the settings on anything. Same rules apply when you're doing portrait type work, when you're turning your camera the other way. The same rules apply. We divide in nine equal quadrants. So the points of interest, as I mentioned, there's four of them. And um, really, when you start taking a look, and you, know, you can go through magazine ads and, and look at other people's work on either Flickr or Facebook, uh, someone who calls themselves a photographer, I mean, you know, we all do, I was showing some silly snaps of my holidays, stuff that I wouldn't publish on my professional page, but, you know, the selfies and the stuff, I don't really apply the rule of thirds because they're more about comedy. They're really bad photography, but it's fun stuff, and it's fun to have for a family album. Um, but when you start looking at photography sites and you start looking at the work of the advanced photographers, you're going to start seeing the rule of third is applied everywhere you go. So if I look at um, this photo here, the eye is drawn to the non-centered object. In this case, it's a male person. And one of the things that happens is our eye is drawn, when we look at a photo or portrait, we're always, whether you know it or not, subconsciously, the first thing you go and you look at the person's eyes. That's the first place that our eyes go. So if I look at the photo, I've placed the eye on a point of interest. And I do this subconsciously. I don't even think about it. Um, I will ask my client, and sometimes my client is me if I'm shooting for myself, what's this photo going to be used for? And I will organize the shot and give that client options in different formats. So though, that's the rule of thirds in a nutshell. That's a very compressed rule of thirds. And you can choose to use it or you can choose to break it. But no matter whatever, whenever you choose to break a rule, you got to know it first. Because okay? it's, not, it's not an end-all, tell-all. You can break that rule and you can create your own. But if you don't know the rule at first, you don't know what's qualified as good photography. It's user-based, right? It's very, it's very much up there. There's no such thing as good photography. It's what we interpret as good photography. But if you choose to break the rule, you better have a reason for it as an artist, and it may make sense. 
think Picasso did it. I mean, there's, there's a million of people that broke the rules, and they were very, very successful at it. Shooting position. Use your feet. If you don't have a zoom lens, it doesn't matter even if you do have a zoom lens, using your feet and moving around in the, uh, in the photo shoot is a big part of your photography. Many people come to my studio classes and they'll slap down a tripod and they're not going to move for the entire shoot. Well, you're missing stuff. Look around. Take a look at what's going on around you. Is there distracting objects in the background? If I'm shooting a family portrait at my grandmother's house, it's a little bit distracting. She's got needlepoint. She's got figurines. She's got all kinds of stuff that are going to be leading your eye all over the photo. Choose your point of view, right? Get down low, get up high. It makes a difference. How many of you have a photo like this in your collection of stuff? <laughs> Whether it be a puppy dog or it be a, a baby or a little rabbit in the yard, um, I think most of us have a photo like that in our collection, right? If I just stop and take control over the photo, these are my two dogs, Gizmo and Gracie. I can right now write them off because I use them in business. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, you know, they're, you guys, Jean knows, I mean, they, they hang around me like there's no, and I can make them do almost anything. But if I just stop and pose the dogs and I get down to their level and be patient, I can grab a much better photo. And I just sat down and thought about it, got down to their level. What's wrong with this picture? Anyone? Pardon me? The pole? Yeah, it's kind of distracting, isn't it? How many of us have taken pictures like that when we're on a trip? And you get home and you go, ah, right? So you got to stop and think about it and say, you know what? If I take a few steps forward, I got a cool picture. But I got a guy in there. <laughs> okay. So, you know, take a second, take a breath, and wait. He's going to walk out. Now, if you're at the most southern point in the U.S., at um, Key West, and you go to the monument that says 90 miles to Cuba, you're going to have to wait a long time for people not to be in front of it. But if you go at 6 a.m., there's nobody there, and the sun's actually better. So if you have control over that, you can use your time of day. Wait for it. Choose your point of view. This is along Highway 2 in Morrisburg using the same camera, and this is the type of tourist shot that a lot of people take, right? I mean, it's kind of cool. I mean, you know, it's Altville that used to be there, one of the old uh, flood villages. But I've got a car, I've got a pole, I've got the end of the track. It just doesn't make sense as a photo. But if I just change my vantage point, I like to apply a little bit of treatment. I use a program that you may have heard of, it's called Photoshop. Um, but, you know, by running a quick action or running a quick filter, I can turn it black and white. I haven't spent a whole lot of time. I hate Photoshop, by the way. Um, if I can't fix my photo or publish my photo, I mean, you have to do a little bit of sharpening or you have to do a little bit of this if you're shooting in the raw mode, which I do. If I have to spend more than 20 to 30 seconds on a photo, it's gone because I take that many photos. I try not to spend time in Photoshop. But just by changing my camera angle, I haven't cropped the photo, I just cropped it with my eyes. I can change it so it looks like the tracks are coming from infinity beyond. I've taken the car out of the equation, made it black and white, and it looks like an antique photo. Right? It's just putting a little bit of thought into it. If I look at this pathway and I decide to change my shooting angle, I can tell a completely different story. It may need some repair. But, I mean, actually walking on it was a little scary. <laughs> but, you know, it, just to give you an idea, this is same camera settings, same camera, that one there, which, you know, may be for sale at the end of this. But uh, it is exactly the same. It's just move your feet or move your body. In this case, I just got down on my knees and took a shot. Create a sense of structure. Lines will, will lead you into the photo. And you may have noticed that already in the other photos, lines are, are bringing the eye and they make the eye wander through the photo. And it's, it's really a good idea to be conscious of what lines are doing around you and is it helping you um, create interest into your photo. So in this case here, the pathway leads me right into the village. Lines can also give you, suggest strength and grandeur. Shooting the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, what is the Vim, not the Vimy Bridge, is it? Uh, out in Barhaven to um, Riverside South. And, um, you know, going at the right time of day, 
and setting up your camera on a tripod and just walking off the beaten path and walking down by the shore. Lines are everywhere. They're in nature. It's organic structures. Everywhere you go, there are lines, and they can help you create a photo, create, lead your eye through the photo. This is taken with the point and shoot again, and it's just, you know, be aware. And you, when you put everything together, you use the rule of thirds and lines together, you can create interest in a photo and create something really kind of wonderful and, you know, you can, you can have your eye go through that photo and see different things every time. Um, to me, the biggest compliment I get is when someone looks at one of my photos and says, you know, I saw that photo the other day, but I never noticed this part or I never noticed that part. So having the viewer being able to wander through your photo is, is one, of my big, one of the biggest compliments to me. And again, using lines and structure, foreground, background, middle ground, uh, will help you get a really cool photo. And also the time of day, you know, on, when it's raining, you've got all kinds of cool reflections that you don't get uh, on a sunny day. One of the biggest things is to frame your composition using lines, and it's so easy to do. Uh, you know, just a step back, and there's natural lines everywhere you look. And silhouettes are cool for that. They emphasize the lines. Using objects that are in the area, you know, the old pier uh, guard uh, with the lighthouse you know, framed up leads your eye through the photo. You might get the idea that I like black and white a lot. Using architectural lines, uh, this is a fairly iconic shot that anyone can go take because you know, we live in a country where you can walk up on the Parliament Hill and wander around the outsides of the buildings and there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Using the foreground elements, the background elements, and using lines to lead the eye through the photo can really create something interesting. As I mentioned, lines lead you through a photo, so use them as much as you can. Start thinking about, I mean, even in this room here, we've got all kinds of wonderful lines that I could take some portraits that would just be you know, kind of fun for me to do. Look at how lines divide this scene, and again, you know, you can meander through the field and you, you almost feel like you're there, because if I had this photo without the fence, it'd be kind of boring. Lines will lead you into an object, whether it's centered or off. It doesn't really matter. The lines there work for you. And again, you know, meandering through the scene. Uh, the S-curve leads you into the distance. It's kind of neat because it disappears. And that's OK. Our eye understands why it disappears. If I had a straight line disappearing, I'd be, I'd be lost, right? You'd be, oh, I'm at a dead end. I love this one. This is my favorite. And those of you who look at my Flickr site or look at any of my websites, and I'll give you some addresses afterwards if you're interested, um, negative space is my favorite. I use it so much. Uh, it's inspired by the rule of thirds. It pushes the subject to a side or a corner, and it creates a sense of isolation, vastness. It just, it just helps create a different type of story and can be very, very effective, especially in graphic arts, especially in advertising, and that's where you know, I tend to be strong. But even in portraiture, it can be very, very strong. Negative space leads you to imagine a scene, or it places a person into a scene, or an object into a scene, and it tells a different story. By having the person off to the side, if I'm shooting commercially, I've now given myself, all, or given the graphic artist, all kinds of room for text and other things there. If I'm looking at it as a portrait, I'm just moving that person off to the side, and it creates some interest. And one of the things that I did not include in here was um, photographs of people looking into a negative space. Okay, but if you're photographing people, they should always look in the negative space especially if you're going to be putting text or another object, if you're going to be making a composition, the person should have interest in what's going on in the negative space. If you have that person looking away from the negative space, especially if it's a business portrait and you're not looking at the writing that's there, uh, you're not interested. And psychologically, the viewer is going to pick that up immediately. They won't know they did, but they will pick it up immediately. So always, I always try to have the person, whether they are looking or they are tilted, into the negative space. Creates a sense of wonder, a sense of interest, all kinds of different things come into your mind. 
It also helps when you have a person with telling a story. Now, even though the boats are out of focus, you wouldn't be surprised that this guy is a boat captain, right? Because he's in his environment and I'm telling the story. Using negative space, but in this case here, it's a blurred, a blurred background. Remember I talked about taking photos at my grandmother's house, and it's kind of cluttered there. There's ways to avoid that, and it's called filling the frame. And filling the frame is if I take this photo here, and I use my zoom lens, right? and I walk into the scene just a little bit closer, I change it into a much more interesting photo. To me, that's not a wall hanger. This may be, right? Just take it a step further. And personally, I take it a step further again, and I did, but I didn't include it in this presentation. I turned to black and white, and this thing immediately popped. Taking a photo of a lifeboat, kind of boring. But getting in a little bit closer and looking at the detail, and now I've got the weathered thing happening, and I've just made it a more interesting photo. Her surroundings were distracting. So I came in right up close, and here I did it in two ways. I did it with a zoom lens, and I did it with my feet. They came up nice and close. By having the zoom lens, I blurred the background so it's not distracting. Getting right up close can tell a different story. Here I'm testing Nikon's new D800 when it came out couple of years ago. This is my nephew, and uh, he's got some pretty strong lines in his face. He's got some angular chin, and he's got um, eyes that just kind of sparkle a little bit. So I want to see how the camera picked up that sharpness. And, and this is actually a little bit over sharpened. Unfortunately, it's mainly because of the program. Uh, I'm using eNote, which doesn't do great justice to high resolution photos. But uh, looking around in nature, you can find things and, you know, taking a picture of a tree trunk with some mushrooms growing out of it, not all that interesting. But if you've got pretty light and you zoom in and you fill the frame, all of a sudden it becomes a much more interesting photo. There's my, my buddy Gizmo again. and I took this photo when the uh, Nikon came out with the D3X, which is a, uh, was their first high-resolution DSLR. And one of the comments on uh, the Nikon forum was, you can have the sharpest camera in the world, but it's still a fuzzy dog. <laughs> so fill the frame. You know, you're walking through a field, and there's really, actually I'm walking through a campground that was very, very busy. And again, using that camera, uh, just by getting up close and filling the frame with the field flowers, I mean, it creates a whole new thing. It doesn't matter that there's a trailer behind there, just and you know, a couple of feet over to the side. You can't see it. So. It creates a really neat composition. Time of day and weather are a huge factor when it comes to photography. Taking a shot in late afternoon can create some really nice shadows. It's very pretty light, not direct harsh sunlight, even though it is a sunny day. And I'm you know, working, it's not too windy, so I've got a nice little reflection off the water. All of those factors come into play. If I went there right now today, you know, I may have some clouds, I certainly have a high wind, so those waves would be choppy, and I wouldn't have those nice kind of blurred shadows. Down below, I'd have choppy waves. This photo would not have worked on a sunny day. It had to be shot on a cloudy day. And you know, the, uh, the weather conditions add to the, the drama, add to the story of the photo. Going out in early morning, you've got that amazing light. If you have the opportunity of being by a lake, uh, this is out by Westport, Ontario. I'm using lines, right? I'm using lines to break up my scene. There's all kinds of interest. There's the buoys, there's the radio tower, uh, there's the horizon line, the foreground, and, and the, the fog. It's all there to break up the photo, and you know, I've got a, a fisherman in silhouette in the fog. I mean, it's kind of a powerful little photo. Doesn't mean that when you're traveling, you can't get lucky once in a while. And I'm on a cruise ship, and now I can write off my trip to Acapulco. <laughs> um, I'm on a cruise ship, and it's golden hour, right? That, depending on where you are in the world, this is around six o'clock in the evening, the sun's going down, all the light is that golden color. I'm standing on the balcony of the stateroom on the ship, and we're going by the little fishing boats, and it just, the light is pretty. My favorite time of day to shoot is called blue hour. And we talked about it in the very first photo that we saw. Going out just as the sun has gone down, the sky is not totally dark yet, 
So we have some blue light coming in through and it's a perfect time to go shoot the Christmas lights somewhere because you have definition. You're not just shooting Christmas lights and everything's black in behind it. You've got layers, right? And uh, it creates interest as well in the photos having different layers, foreground, background, and middle ground. Shooting at night can be very, very powerful. There's all kinds of cool stuff here. In this case, uh, one of the easiest lighting tricks that I could have was the cars going by. This is on the sidewalk on Richmond Road at one of the cafes. And having the cars going by, the young lady gives her backlighting. And it just, now I only have to carry one light with me to light her face, and it gives me depth. So this is a little bit of a, a little bit more of an advanced shot. It's off-camera flash use, but you could still do it with a built-in flash as well. This is the most important one. Keep your camera ready. Okay? If your camera has a dialable zoom, try not to drop it this time. If your camera has a dialable zoom that must be turned on, turn the power on. It still works. <laughs> turn the power on. Okay? You say, well, the batteries are going to die off really quickly. Buy an extra battery. They're, they're not expensive. Nowhere near as expensive as a camera. Buy an extra memory card. Keep those in your pocket. Walk around with your camera on and ready to shoot because you never know what's going to be around the next corner. Okay. The other thing, and it's, I've, this happened to me many times, I normally walk around with it's such a small camera. I walk around with that thing on my shoulder all the time when I'm going for walks with the dogs, anything at all. I'm carrying a camera and it's on. It's ready to shoot. I've gone back and thought, oh, that was such a great shot. I gotta go back and bring the dogs home, grab the camera, go back, it's gone. Right? That person's no longer there or the opportunity is gone. So one of the things that, that I've always said, and I didn't use a whole lot of photos here, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what's going on, if you sit and look around, a photo will come to you. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. I've been sitting on the dock on an ocean bay with my camera, and all of a sudden a parasailer comes by. Now, I'm serious, and it did. I mean, it was a great shot. I didn't include it today, but because I've tried to keep this under 2,000 slides. <laughs> but no matter where you are, on a photo walk, I'm, I'm walking through the woods, not too far from home, out in Barhaven, and I come across this lady who's got this really cool cart. She's got her service animal, and she's just sitting there waiting for a photo by the bird's ear. And if I hadn't had my camera, I actually I asked her, I said, would you mind if I take your portrait? And of course, so we exchanged email addresses and I sent her her portrait. She didn't know who I was. It's the other thing, don't be shy. Sir, would you mind if I take your photo? You have a very, very interesting tie. Yeah, go ahead. You know, very rarely will someone say no. They're shocked more than anything else that I asked. And we, we exchanged cards and we, I, sent, I always send them their photo as a thank you. But you know, you're walking around out in the woods. Hey, squirrel, will you do that again? Will you hold that little nut out for me? Probably not going to listen to you. <laughs> you probably just say, see you later. Okay, but I mean, if the camera wasn't ready, and sometimes, I mean, if you're shooting nature, this doesn't happen very often that you walk up to a squirrel and he's going to look up at you. Okay, generally you've got to sit down maybe put some bird seed down, put some carrots down, or whatever it is that you do. I mean, I'm not encouraging anyone to bait the photos, but people do it, okay? And the animals will come. Same thing if you're doing a lot of people, anyone into street photography? Street photography? Going downtown with a camera and taking pictures of people and buildings and stuff like that? It's really kind of neat. And our biggest fear as a photographer is people are going to go, hey, hey, you took my picture. Okay? Stand there by a, by a lamp post or stand up against a building with a small camera, not a huge lens, and take some pictures. Don't publish them on the web. I'm not using them here. These are my pictures only. But I've got some phenomenal pictures of people doing I took a day out, an afternoon, just to go and push myself that today I'm going to take pictures of people on their cell phones. So I went and sat at Cooper and Bank, and I just sat there on a bench, and I snapped pictures. Nobody saw me after the first two minutes that I was there. And, you know, I have a, um, I have a 300 millimeter lens for this camera that's this long. So nobody knows that I'm zooming in on them. And I got some amazing photos, but they're from my collection only. But you know, give yourself an assignment, go out and do it. If you have a DSLR or a camera with interchangeable lenses, and you have a 10 millimeter lens, and you hardly ever use it, give yourself an assignment. Today I'm going out 
and I'm only going to shoot with that lens, and I'm going to create some wonderful photos. And if they weren't wonderful, go out tomorrow and try it again until you get used to using, no, but it's seriously, until you get used to using that lens and thinking how that lens was going to improve your photos. If I go back at any other time to this park on Lion Street in Somerset, chances are I'm not going to see 10 Harley Davidson police bikes lined up in a, in a perfect row. So by having the camera ready, I parked my truck across the street, I grabbed my camera and went, to it. I'm into Harley Davidson, so what can I tell you? It's kind of an ironic scene, you know, the little tiny house, the big golf cart, but <laughs> it wasn't there when I walked back around the block with the dogs. So I would have missed a shot had I not had my camera there ready and ready to shoot. And you know, sometimes stories just happen. <laughs> They're interesting, and if your camera's ready, you're going to capture it. And he's a typical Harley guy. I mean, <laughs> so have your camera ready to shoot and pick up that moment. I did not because their faces are not in the photo. If their faces had been in the photo and I knew that I was going to use that photo in a presentation, I would get a release form. I would. And it's as simple as saying, you know, I, so and so, agree to let you as a photographer use my image for non-monetary gain. Very few people will sign, will not sign it for you. Um, I use it anytime I'm shooting a model uh, for where chances are the photo will be used in this type of a presentation. Being and waiting for the right moment, again, I've used the elements, I've used the lines, I've framed my photo, I've got the sunset, and I just waited for that moment. That bird is not photoshopped in, he actually flew across. I was hoping he was going to fly across the sun, but he wasn't that cooperative. So, I mean, that's it. That's in a nutshell um, how you can improve your photos just by putting a little bit of thought into composition. Use simple rules. There are a few more, um, but these are the main ones, and this hopefully will help you uh, make your photos a bit better. I'm almost out of time, so thank you so much for being here again. Well, that's the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed putting it together for you. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That way you won't miss the next one. Leave us your comments down below. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. That's how we learn. Don't forget we have a website, snapshotshow.com. There you'll find uh, galleries from the photos taken within an episode. Uh, we've also talked about the Flickr in this episode, so I've put a link there for Flickr as well. And uh, don't forget we have Facebook, Snapshot Show. And there you'll find some behind the scenes footage and some comments and all kinds of good stuff, news about the show. So get out there, give yourself an assignment, practice the rules of composition. Remember, shoot lots because pixels are free. Catch you on the next one. Bye for now.